All right, so it is good to finally be back in person. We are doing complex analysis, math 383. And what we are at is, I believe, lecture 16. And so what we're going to be doing today is we're going to start our conformal mapping. So if you've been looking very carefully at the book, you will notice that we are leapfrogging over a couple of chapters, which we will return to later. Uh, one of the few things I don't like about the chapters, or at least the way the book is formatting things, is it doesn't say your theorem 8.4.2 to let you know it's coming from section four of chapter eight. It's just theorem 4.2. So it makes it a little bit harder when you're just quickly glancing down to see where you are. But we are deliberately skipping a couple of things. So what I want to do today is I want to review inverse functions based on a couple of other items over the semester where people have, I'll phrase it as not always remembered things I think you should be remembering from high school or early college classes. I might want to use some of the time today to review some more items like that. Uh, there's a great book by Professor Garrity. Anybody know which title I'm thinking of? Yes, you know, all the math you need for grad school. Yeah, that's a good book to look at for you know more things that might have somehow fallen through the cracks. Given that this is a lecture on conformal maps, not surprisingly, we will be talking about conformal maps and what they are. The book has you know nice discussion about how unfortunately people sometimes have slightly different definitions of what they mean by stuff like this. So you have to be careful. Uh, there's a lot of geometry in terms of preserving angles and whatnot. Yeah, there's a limit to how much of that we're going to get into. If you really delve into the geometric aspects of the subject. This is going to be far more important. I really want to get to the number theory, not surprisingly, as I am a number theorist. But right now, the main point is to just be aware that depending on what book you look at, you might have a slightly different definition. Uh, yesterday, I was actually giving a talk on some work I did over the summer with some students at a conference in India. Uh, and one of the things that was a little bit annoying is we were talking about quadratic, binary quadratic forms. And depending on who you talk to, there's two different normalizations as to do you include a factor of two or not? Are you saying integer or half integer? And it's just something to be very aware of, especially when you do a subject that cuts across different disciplines, check and see what notation, what conventions are they using? All right, and then towards the end, we will talk about specific conformal maps. One of the best quotes I ever heard is it's a shame that we can't visualize four dimensions well, because then you could view the image of a complex function because you know, if you have a complex function that's a two-dimensional input and a two-dimensional output, so we need four dimensions. There's games you can play. You know, some of the games you can play is you can use color, you can use something like that to maybe indicate the absolute value. And then the height might be the angle or vice versa. Maybe the height is going to be the absolute value and then the color might be the angle, the argument attached to it. Or you might just plot the absolute value of your function, try to look at something like that. But we can't really visualize too well, unfortunately, um, these complex plots. So I'm gonna just try to show you a little bit of some tricks you might be able to do in Mathematica to try to get a sense of what's going on. You're gonna sometimes have to override various uh, items in Mathematica. This is how I spent this morning because it constantly was resizing my windows so that you couldn't see what you wanted. And so one of the solutions I said is, well, I'm going to just always force it to draw the following circle. I don't really care about the circle, but if I force it to draw it, then it's going to fix the size of the box. And now I can finally see what I want. So if you've never heard of a kluge, kluge is just something that works that you can just use and just move on. It's a lot of things go for that in life. General items, I almost feel like I can just leave the first one for almost every lecture I give. You know, the differences between real and complex. As a rule of thumb, whenever you're doing anything in mathematics, always ask, is this related to anything I've studied before? And try to use that to build intuition, try to look at some special cases. The danger, of course, is real analysis and complex analysis are such wildly different subjects that your intuitions can be very misleading. And then the other item, and this is something that's a bit more of a challenge the further you go in mathematics, is what theorems should you use to try to solve a problem? So in a Introductory calculus class of section 3.2 is on the chain rule. You don't have to be a Newton or a Leibniz to figure out what you should be using to solve problems from section 3.2 on the chain rule. It's kind of hard to hide it. But when you go deeper, what should you use? Well, if you're not sure, one of the best things to do is just say, is this related to anything I've seen before? And if so, what has been useful in those problems? What can I relate this to? What is this similar to? And if that doesn't work, then what you basically just do is you go down your list of what should I try. And so 
what are some good theorems we have in complex analysis? Cauchy integral. So is somebody, uh, since Ben is not here, is somebody going to be filling in from and keeping a track of Cauchy versus Riemann? Oh, oh, oh. Thank you for stopping up. All right, so that's one point, but I'm not going to say who the point is for yet because that would give them two points and that's unfair. So one is to use the Cauchy Riemann, I don't know, what do you say? The Cauchy integral formula, the Cauchy integral formula. Another is, you know, Cauchy Riemann equation, you know, all these consequences in terms of quantum integrals. What else do we have? Liouville's theorem, you know, bounded entire function constant. What else do we have? Maximum modulus. Maximum modulus. And where does maximum modulus come from? Um, argument. Where's the argument? This is coming from basically which dead person? I'm sorry? Rouché. Rouché. So we had a lot of consequences from Rouché's theorem. So we had, you know, counting, you know, how many zeros there are, how many solutions there are. We had the maximum modulus principle. And we also had one other item. Open mapping. Open mapping. Completely different than real analysis. So these are at least a bunch of things to try. There's one last one that I would want to include. I just love this. Something very different from complex analysis. Oh, I'm sorry, very different in complex analysis from real analysis. Beautiful theorem about when a function might be identically zero. Points of accumulation. That's a wonderful argument to have as well. So when you're trying to do a problem and you're stuck on things, he has a bunch of things to just try. And you know, my first year here, I taught differential equations just after my daughter was born. And I taught it from the perspective of, you know, yet again, a new father. Baby is crying. Why is baby crying? Let me go through the list of possibilities. Eventually, you start realizing this is the I want to be held cry. This is I want a bottle cry. This is I want to watch the Red Sox cry. This is I'm crying because I'm watching the Red Sox. You, know, you start to detect which one it is after a while. And you start to see this is going to be an accumulation argument. This is going to be a uh, Cauchy integral formula argument. Okay. So inverse functions. I have here functions f and g such that f of g of z is z. And similarly, g of f of z should be z. It should go both ways. And we've done a little bit of this before. I think we did arctangent. Do we do arctangent in this class? By looking at the tangent of arctangent of x is x to then integrate one over one plus x squared. I thought we had done that, no? Okay. Well, what's nice is the lectures have been recorded, and so we can always just go back and check. I think we did. So one of the beautiful things about having inverse functions is you can find the derivative for one if you know the other. So if we have f of g of z equals z, then by the chain rule, f prime of g of z times g prime of z is one, the derivative of z is easy to get. Therefore, g prime of z is one over f prime g of z. So if I know the derivative of f, I now get for free the derivative of g. So a good example was if we take the tangent of the arctangent of x. Well, if I take the tangent of the angle whose tangent is x, I just get x. And so then according to this, we would get the derivative of arctangent is just one over tangent prime at arctangent of x. And then with a little bit of work, you see it's one over one plus x squared. So the way you prove this is you draw the triangle. And so if I want a angle here with the tangent of x, I would choose my sides like this. And then this would just be the hypotenuse would be the square root of one plus x squared. And then you just go through and you do the algebra derivative of tangent is one over cosine squared, which is just secant squared. And so then if I have a one over tangent prime, then that becomes a cosine squared up top. Cosine is just going to be one over square root of one plus x squared, and the dust will settle. Another good example is the exponential of the log of x equals x. And so if we know the derivative of the exponential function, we can use this to get the derivative of the log of it. So do we know the derivative of the exponential function? Well, we've defined exponential of x to be the sum 
and goes from zero to infinity, x to the n over n factorial. And then with a little bit of work, we see that its derivative is just also the sum and goes from zero to infinity of x to the n over n factorial. So it equals its own derivative. So you can just justify the term by term differentiation. The n factorial is growing so rapidly that everything converges beautifully. And so we now get that the derivative of the logarithm is equal to one over the derivative of the exponential function evaluated the log of x. Ah, but the derivative of the exponential function is just the exponential function evaluated the log of x. That's just one over x. And here is the classic proof that the derivative of the logarithm is one over x. You've got to be careful when you start looking at some of these books as to what is your definition and what is your theorem. I'm starting with my basic object as the exponential function. I'm doing everything from the exponential function, and now I'm getting consequences of the logarithm. You could, of course, start with a logarithm. And then instead of looking at exponential of log of x, what would you look at? Log of exponential of x. And so you can build it up the other way as well. Which do you want to work with as your fundamental object? OK. So what is the main idea that we're going to study today? We want to try to understand when sets are equivalent. Well, equivalent how? For us, we want to say that there is a holomorphic bijection. So holomorphic means that the function has to be holomorphic or analytic, because they're the same for us in complex analysis. And a bijection means the map is one-to-one -one and onto, or injective, surjective, you know, whichever words you want to use. Uh, it's always nice when you have multiple you know, ways of phrasing the same thing. So what does it mean to be one-to-one? -one? So one-to-one -one or injective means what? Not quite. For each element in the domain is mapped to an element in the range. Not quite, you're afraid to get ever so slightly off. If, if um, you have certain inputs, the map is a good. Good. No two objects are mapped to the same. I could have the map where everything is mapped to the origin. And then if my domain, I'm sorry, if my range is just the origin, then everything in the domain is hit, and it's hit by everything. So one to one objective means if f of z1 equals f of z2, then z1 equals z2. So distinct points go to distinct points. Okay, what does onto or subjective mean? So what does it mean to you? Yes. Good. If W is in the range, then there exists a Z such that F of Z equals W. So we hit everything. Yes. I know I was about to say. So depending on who you talk to, there is a difference between the range and the image. And so some people say the range is your possible outputs and the image is the outputs that arise. Some people like to use codomain. And so it, it is a real joy of notation, right? And so it's actually a trivial theorem that you are subjective onto your image. Because the image is defined as the points you hit. So it's really not that hard to prove that every function is subjective on its image. Because you're then just restricting. So for instance, if I look at the parabola, you know, f of x equals x squared, if I consider the range to be the real numbers, then it's not subjective because I miss everything that's negative. If I consider the range to be the non-negative real numbers, then all of a sudden it is subjective. And so for some things, we can actually you know, adjust things and make them subjective 
just by restricting the output that we look at. And so the big question is, given two sets U and V, is there an easy way to tell when there is a equivalence between them? So again, you know, here is U, here is V, and I want some function F and I want it to be invertible and I want it to be holomorphic. Just looking at this, do you think that this is going to be possible in this case? Why not? Yeah, one is not simply connected. One has two holes. So the question is, what properties might be preserved under some kind of equivalence like this? If I have something that has two holes, maybe it can't be equivalent to something with just one hole or no holes. That's different than saying everything with two holes is equivalent to anything else with two holes. But maybe we can have some easy low hanging fruit that if you have a different number of holes, you clearly can't be equivalent. How might you attack something like that? You know, what are your thoughts? You know, we just had, you know, this is an impromptu lecture. We just had a discussion earlier today. If you have to use something, go through your list. What might you want to use? Yeah, use like a Cauchy's integral. What if I take uh, some kind of curve that goes around here? What do you think that curve is going to look like when I take its image and I pull it back onto you? Some closed curve. Some closed curve. It, it could be you know, crazy like this, but you know, it should be you know, some closed curve as well. And so maybe if I pull back a holomorphic function, it's pullback is going to be holomorphic. And I can choose something that's not going to have an integral of zero on one side, maybe an integral of zero on the other. And maybe I can somehow use this to get a contradiction. This is not a proof. We have not proved anything. But we've talked about, here's a plan of attack. So that if I see a problem like this, here are some things I might think to try. And again, that's what I really care about right now is, what would you try for something like this? I would try, you know, very simple. I would take like a circle with a hole in the middle, you know, make it as easy as possible, a nice ring around that circle and show that it's not going to work. All right. So the general question is, you know, given two sets U and V, the more specific one is we choose one of our sets to be the unit disk. The unit disk is extremely important in complex analysis, as is anything that is conformally equivalent to it. We will see explicitly that the upper half plane, the set of all Z where Y is greater than zero, Z equals X plus IY, is going to be conformally equivalent to the unit disk. So that means that rather than studying things on the unit disk, we could study equivalently things on the upper half plane. And then the question becomes, which spaces are equivalent to either one of those? Yes? Is it conformally equivalent to these primes? No, I mean, it is in the book right now for us, that's going to be a holomorphic rejection. You know, we're looking for, you know, one of these nice functions like this to map from our U to our V. If you do physics, it's sometimes, how many of you have ever seen any of these maps in physics? Okay, so sometimes they do come up with these, you know, studying some problems in electricity and magnetism, these conversions to looking at related problems. And the idea is if I can solve the problem in one system, I can then convert and solve it in another. Depending on how the information is given to you, sometimes one coordinate system is more convenient than the other. This is one of the big points of linear algebra. You know, depending on your problem, sometimes one coordinate system is better. It's more natural to write things down like that. And then you just want things to be in, in that uh, system. And the hope is that we can then use uh, conformal maps to understand how to pass from one to the other. So, for example, yes. Formal mapping, like the strongest distance. Why? Because uh, homeomorphism doesn't say what the function is, and I'm saying I want my function to be holomorphic. So imagine, I think I'm still in red. So here's u. Here's v. And I have some function f here 
and some function f inverse here. And so maybe I have some function h from u to u. And then what I can do is maybe I have some function g from v to v. Is there a way to relate these functions to each other? Well, if I have a function from v to v, I can associate to g a function from u to u. So g is from v to v. Let's look at g composed with f. Where does that act now? What input does that take? It's, it's from what? Um, it's from u to v. And so if I go f inverse g composed with f, that will be from u to u. So what this is telling us is, given some function on v, I can associate a function on u. And conversely, given one on u, I can associate one on v. And the hope is, if I understand the functions from v to v, I understand the functions from u to u that hopefully there's a nice one-to-one -one correspondence. So the hope is a one-to-one -one correspondence enough to study just one. And so that's one of the reasons why we care so much about these equivalences, because if we can understand completely one problem, then we understand all of it. If you take the unit disk, if you take the upper half plane, these are really nice spaces. And so maybe we can write things down a little bit more explicitly, we can understand things a little bit better, and then we can pass that on to the other spaces. So I would say maybe I want G to be holomorphic. So maybe I'm looking at some kind of you know, holomorphic function. What do you mean by everything maps to zero? So you, you, you could take that function, then you would get a similar function from u to u that would map everything to zero. Or at least everything to some point. The idea is that if I understand a space of functions on V, if I have this equivalence with an F and an F inverse, I can pass all the functions from V to V to functions from u to u. And the hope is because f is a nice invertible function, that properties are going to be preserved. They could be general functions right now. And so if I take, for instance, a g that's one to one and on to one v, I hope I would get an associated function that's one to one and on to on u. And the idea is if we can understand, for instance, uh, say the automorphisms from v to v. Uh, we can understand the automorphisms from u to u. So we'll, we'll talk about this in greater detail. I'm just trying to motivate why we care about these equivalences. The idea is that if we understand one space, we hopefully understand all the spaces that's equivalent to it. This is the classic without loss of generality. Um, so you're that yes. That so we need to prove that f inverse is holomorphic. Yes. Okay. yes. So here is the first proposition. Again, I don't like the notation because when you see proposition 1.1, you have no idea which chapter this is from. This is from chapter eight. So it's really proposition 8.1.1. So let's let F be a holomorphic and injective function from U to V. Then F prime of Z is not zero for all Z in U. In particular, the inverse of F defined on the range is holomorphic. And thus, the inverse of a conformal map is also holomorphic. And so, again, this comes down to you know, what do we mean by the output? And so, when we're using range here, you know, this is just the possible value that it takes out. So, it's not a big deal that it's going to be subjective there. The big deal is that things are going to be invertible. And that you're going to have a holomorphic map. So just because my map is holomorphic does not mean my inverse map is holomorphic. And so we'll look at some examples in real analysis to try to get a sense of what's going on. So do you think that this result is true if we restrict ourselves to real analysis 
let's take a real analytic function. So this is going to be a function which is infinitely differentiable, maps the real numbers to the real numbers, or maybe even a subset. Maybe I'll look at some function f from the interval negative one, one to the interval negative one, one. And let's say it is, f is real analytic and injective. Must f prime of x never equal zero? Okay, can you give me an example? No, but if, if you take f of x equals x, f prime of x is identically one, so the zero is the derivative is never zero. Okay, so we want to have sine of x mapping which interval to which interval. Uh, So sine of x is a little bit, because we're not going over the whole period too high. So you might be able to make it work. Here is a nice simple example, x cubed. So this is the classic example. F of x is x cubed. And you know, I'm not gonna bother drawing it too well. So here's negative one, here's one, here's negative one, here's one. F prime of x is three x squared f prime of zero is zero. So we have a function which maps negative one, one to negative one, one. It's infinitely differentiable. It's given by its Taylor series expansion, but its derivative does vanish. What is the inverse function? So let's solve, um, you know, f of x is x cubed equals y. We want g of x such that f of g of x equals x. So we want g of x cubed equals x. So g of x is x to the one third. That's the inverse function. You could also solve it by saying, you know, if x cubed equals y, then x equals y to the one third. You know, going in the other direction. You can use you know, either approach. So I've got my new function, g of input is input to the one third. Is this a good function? What's the derivative of g of x? Yeah. Okay, I'm, I missed the very beginning. Good. And so what is troubling about this function? Yeah, the derivative blows up at zero. Not differentiable at x equals zero. So in terms of just trying to get a sense of what's going on, in the real case, I do have an invertible function. But my invertible function is not differentiable at the point x equals zero. So the statement that not only do you have this holomorphic map sometimes between two regions, but that the inverse is also holomorphic, this is serious content. This is not necessarily going to be the case in real analysis. But again, what I want to try to do is I want to try to emphasize points that are not made in the book. So what's going wrong? What if we tried to do this as you know, complex value function, your know, f of z is z cubed? Well, the positive real axis stays where it is under z cubed. What happens to the negative real axis? It also stays where it is. The difference is if you look at other rays coming out from the origin, you can have two different rays that when you cube go to the same place. So if you take something, you know, e to the two pi i over three, when you cube that, that now becomes a positive real. And so this is where you're losing uniqueness. This is where you're losing that injectivity. But if we happen to restrict ourselves to that sliver, the real axis, well, if we restrict ourselves like that, 
as a really analytic function, it is an isomorphism. Its derivative doesn't exist, however, at every point. And so this is just to really hammer home how careful we have to be. I, I want to go over the proof that they gave in the book. And I'm going to modify it a little bit, but I want to just you know, post it up here and just talk about how dense these proofs can sometimes be. So we want to show that f prime of z can't be zero if we have this you know, holomorphic injective function from u to v. I would have argued a little bit differently. Who knows what WLOG means? Without loss of generality. I love without loss of generality. Right? Without loss of generality, what is the point z naught? Zero. And what's the value of f of z naught? Nope. Nope. Without loss of generality, choose z naught to be zero. And what should f of z naught equal? Zero. Right? You might as well just adjust things. You know, minimize the notation as much as possible. I've got some map from u to v. So I'll just go down to the next page. So without loss of generality, adjust so that z naught equals zero. f of z naught is now f of zero is just zero. Well, to adjust to have z naught be zero, I'm just translating everything. And if I want f of zero to be zero, if necessary, just subtract the fixed constant from everything. So it's really not a big deal to assume that my initial point is zero and the value of the function at that point is zero. I'm just normalizing things so that if this is u and this is v, here is zero, here is zero. And when I have my function f, this is just going to be f of zero. I'm just adjusting like that. And if it wasn't, I can just do this by some translations. It just allows me to make things a little bit nicer over here. And so I will take off, I'll just cross out the f of z naught. And there's, it's a little bit less clutter. So f of z naught is gone. And then z naught is just going to be zero. Zero, zero, zero. Oh, that's just f of z naught, but that's just zero, so we can just get rid of that completely. Okay. So now let's look at what's going on. So we're going to argue by contradiction, we're going to assume that f prime of zero. F prime of z naught is not zero for some point z naught. Right. So again, I might as well assume that that point is zero you know, when I'm doing all of this. So you can assume f prime of zero is not zero. So what does it mean if I say the first derivative is not zero? Well, my function is holomorphic. Holomorphic means analytic, so I have a series expansion. And because I've now adjusted it, so that f of zero is zero, there's no constant term in the Taylor series expansion. Because we're assuming the first derivative is zero, there's no linear term in the Taylor series expansion. So the Taylor series expansion, the earliest it can be would be something like a z squared. Okay. And so let's go back and now let's look and say, let's imagine we have f of z is a z squared, f is holomorphic and one-to-one. -one. Do you believe that f can be holomorphic and one-to-one -one near zero? You get, this is the simplest possible f. You know, what are we doing here? On the previous slide, we're looking at our Taylor series expansion. And we're saying it's going to start off, you know, a z to the k for some k at least two plus something else. If we can't do the special case where that something else is zero, the simplest thing we could have is a z squared. Let's analyze a z squared. If we can't analyze a z squared, we're not going to handle the more general case. Okay, what can you tell me? Do you think that this can be analytic? Yeah, it's just a z squared. All right, polymorphic isn't bad. Do you think it's one to one near zero? No, why not? 
Yeah, all the negatives. So for instance, you know, if I take any positive um, small real number, both a positive number and a negative number will square to it. So clearly not one to one. Near z equals zero. So this is not a proof, but this is basically saying, you know, if we didn't have all that, you know, g of z stuff, we'd be done. Did it crucially matter that we had az squared? If we had az cubed, would the same argument apply? Yeah, we would just look at either the two pi i over k. So also if f of z is az to the k for k greater than equal to three, we have a problem. And just look at points like, you know, epsilon e to the two pi i over k. So this shows you that if we don't have anything else, if we just have the pure problem, f of z is az to the k, we can prove that it's not one to one and get a contradiction. Therefore, the first derivative can never be reached. Now we just have to handle what's going on in the more general case. And so when we write it like this, hopefully, Boucher's theorem should be dancing on your fingertips. If for no other reason than the fact that I've actually put it in the upper right hand corner of the slide. But we're talking about a analysis where we have you know, a main term and a small tweak. If we throw away the tweak, we know what to do. So this is a standard technique now. Solve the problem first when you don't have any of the solution, and then use Rouché to deal with, well, what happens if we add that little bit of G of Z? Well, when you look at G of Z, because we have our series expansion, G of Z has to have at least a Z to the K plus one. So if you're really close to Z equals zero, G of Z is going to be much, much smaller than A Z to the K, because it has an extra power of Z. It doesn't matter how small A is, eventually G of Z is going to be much smaller. So since it's much smaller, uh, if we let F of Z be, um, a z to the k minus w, if w is a small number close to the origin, there will be k solutions to that. That means, since k is at least two, there have to be at least two z such that your big F of z is equal to w. So then if we look at big F of z plus big g of z, there must be at least two z's that equal w. And we're trying to get a contradiction. We're trying to get a contradiction that our function was supposed to be injective. It's supposed to be one-to-one. -one. Different inputs go to different outputs. And we're trying to get a contradiction. So we have two solutions. But that's not yet enough for contradiction because it could be a double root. You know, if I give you the function you know, z to the fourth equals zero, it's a quadruple root at zero. So there's four z's that work, but they're all the same z. So for contradiction here, I have to show that there's two different z's that gets sent to the same thing. And so by Rocher's theorem, we know that there's at least two zeros. Now, this is where the, it gets really tense. Since f prime of z is not equal to zero, for all z not equal to z not, but sufficiently close to zero, I guess the z not should be a zero. Why is f prime of z not equal to zero if you're close to zero? That's something that the kind of really gloss over. So we have f prime of zero is equal to zero by assumption. Claim f prime of z does not equal zero if z is near zero, but not zero. So the book made that claim. It made it very, very rapidly. It just said, since f prime of z is not zero for all z not equal to zero, but sufficiently close. Why can the book say that? It's points of accumulation. And so the reason it's by points of accumulation. If this was false, what you can do, well, that's really bad. But 
you can have a sequence if you want of deformed circular kind of like elliptical contours. And on each one of these, I can have a point where F prime vanishes. And as I keep taking these, you know, I would have a sequence that accumulates. And what must be true then if I have a sequence that accumulates? It must be identically zero. So this would imply my function is identically zero. Does that violate any of the assumptions? It's holomorphic and injective. Yeah, that's going to violate injective if the function is constant. So this can be justified by points of accumulation. So this is points of accumulation. Okay, so it's, it follows that the roots have to be distinct. Why is that true? So we know that F prime is not zero anywhere nearby. If you had two roots that were the same, if you had um, a double root somewhere, when you looked at the Taylor series expansion, you would then start off with, you know, the Taylor series expansion at that point would be zero plus no linear term plus at least a quadratic term. And then that would have a derivative zero and that would violate the fact that it's not zero to sufficiently full neighbor. So you have to add a few more steps there to do it a little bit more carefully. All right. So if you happen to have two uh, solutions that were the same, if you had a double root, then locally near that, you could write it as you know, zero plus zero plus some constant z minus z1 squared. And then when you take the derivative, you would then get the derivative of that as zero. And that violates the fact that the derivative is not zero in the small neighborhood. So just, you, know, you have to be a little bit careful when you're reading books, as you go deep and deep in mathematics, people put in less and less detail of what's going on. And it's just, it's assumed that you can see lurking in the background, there's an accumulation point argument. Okay. What I want to do now is just end with a couple of you know, the famous conformal maps. So we have f of z is i minus z over i plus z. g of w is i of one minus w over one plus w. And the theorem is that the map f takes the upper half plane. So h is going to be the set of all z equal x plus i y with y greater than zero and d is going to be the set of all z, the absolute value of z is less than one. So the unit disk and the upper half plane. And the result is that they are conformally equivalent, but there is a map between them. I realize right now I, I did not prove that the inverse of our function is differentiable. If there's time today, I will go back and do that. If not, the book's argument there is very straightforward and I'll just post that in the slides later. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to just plot this a little bit. When you're looking at this, you know, again, it's kind of hard to get a sense of what's going on. But if I plot, if I do parametric plots, if I, if I take Z to be along a one dimensional curve, I can then plot that very easily in the complex plane. A really good choice is to take Z to be real value. Because then you have I minus Z over I plus Z, if Z is real value, what can you say about the magnitude of F of Z? Z is real value. I'm sorry? So if Z is real value, what is true about the magnitude of I minus Z over I plus Z? I'm sorry? Well, I'm asking the magnitude of the ratio of I minus Z over I plus Z. So I minus eight over I plus eight, what's the magnitude of that? One, why one? The bottom is the complex conjugate at the top. So if you take the ratio of two complex conjugates, it's just one. So if I restrict Z to be real valued, I'm going to just get points on the unit circle. And that's what I started to draw here. I drew um, going from, I think this is, you know, I, I can do it as a parametric plot. Let's see if I can do this so we can actually see the movie. 
so here, you know, I, I start up, yeah, I start off with a small value of C. And as I increase C, I, you know, plotting from minus C to C, you can see it's getting closer and closer to the whole thing. What I don't like about this is when I'm showing it like this, it keeps changing where it's focusing. And so I do this deliberately just so you can see how annoying it can be to look at things. All right. The next one I did is I chose Z to be, you know, T, a real number, plus one half I. So it's very similar to before, except now instead of just plotting a line on the real axis, I'm plotting something shifted up a little bit. So essentially what I'm doing is I'm taking the upper half plane and I'm plotting, good, I'm sorry, horizontal lines. And I'm seeing where do the horizontal lines go? The boundary of the upper half plane seems to go to the boundary of the unit disk. What if I move up half a unit? I get the following. And again, I'm plotting this up to 10. What kind of shape does this look like? You have to guess. Circle. So you can go through and do the calculation and see, is this actually a circle? And so uh, one of the things I did to just be a little bit fun is I set it up so that I can use the manipulate command and I can vary a parameter. I'm physically forcing it to always draw a circle of radius R just so you can see how things are. And then over here, I'm plotting uh, my function, I'm, you know, I minus Z over I plus Z, where Z is equal to T plus C times I, and C is gonna go from zero to 100. So if I shift back to the Mathematica notebook, and down. Instead of actually going up to 100, let's just go down to 10. All right, so right now I've got r equals 1. I can make r, you know, a little bit larger just to move it out of the way of the action. Or I can just keep r equals 1 and we'll see what happens. And so when r equals 1 and c equals 0, the two things are the same. And as I slowly increase c, what seems to happen? Do you think this covers every point in the unit disk, the shrinking circles? If it doesn't, then it's not, yes. Y yes, so I am not talking about the boundary. Uh, one of my favorite lines from one of George Collins' routines, he has a beautiful, brilliant one on airplanes. So they say, he goes to and analyzes all the words that they use incorrectly. And at one point, you know, the airlines always say, you know, it is now time to get on the plane. You know, let evil can evil get on the plane. I'm going to go in the plane. Right? When we are talking about this, we are talking about open sets. We are not talking about the boundary. And it is an extremely interesting question as to when can you extend stuff like this to the boundaries. And so here, does it seem like we're getting every point? Yeah, and as a nice exercise, because we have things written so explicitly, what you can and should do is you know, go back and you know, here are my maps. F of Z equals I minus Z over I plus Z. Well, what we can do is we have F of Z is I minus Z over I plus Z choose w in the unit disk, solve for f of z equals w. So you want i minus z over i plus z equals w. What are you going to get when you try to solve this? We'll get i minus z equals w i plus z. And we're trying to solve for z. So this is the same as i minus wi, I think, equals wz plus z. So we get z is equal to i minus wi over 1 plus w. And now the only question is, is this in the upper half plane? Is this in h? So I'll let you finish that. But there's a really good explicit formula to try to you know, calculate stuff like this. So I hope 
using the mathematical gives you a little bit of a sense of what's going on. We seem to notice that if we take this horizontal line, the horizontal line, it looks like it's being mapped to a circle. So that would be a nice thing to try to prove. You know, does this map map horizontal lines to circles? And again, what I'm trying to do is treat this almost like an experimental science today. Because rather than just coming in and stating all the theorems and going through the book and doing it in order, here we did some simulations, we did some experiments, we gathered some data. Is this true in general? So I will leave it for there. Have a good weekend all. And then we will continue.